Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamancy. Tonight, Team Canada in the pool and on the podium. McNeil takes it for Canada. The first Canadian gold medal win at Tokyo 2020 after a silver start to the games. I wanted it so bad I wouldn't accept anything else. Adrian is poolside with the Olympians. Have you called home yet? Backlash after a controversial NHL draft pick has the Montreal Canadiens on defense. He's a young man who made a serious mistake of judgment. Holy crap. The shifting wildfires in British Columbia and the desperately needed help that's just arrived. And as life gets back to normal, pets are being left behind. The animals are kind of slipping to the side a little bit. What owners are telling rescue organizations? This is the next. The Olympic flame in Tokyo is burning, competition is heating up, and for Canada, gold. With day three of the Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games underway, Canada continues its success in the pool. McNeil takes it for Canada. Maggie McNeil winning in the 100-meter butterfly, not just the first Canadian gold, but also the first Canadian double medalist in Tokyo after her win with the women's 4 by 100 meter relay team anchored by Penny Alexiak. Their silver was Canada's first medal. That was followed by Jennifer Abel and Melissa Citrini Beaulieu, also with silver in synchronized diving. Canada appears to be in its element. Adrian is at Tokyo's Aquatic Centre where Canada's podium success in these games has begun. So, Ian, get used to seeing the pool over the next week or so. The first part of the Olympics is always about the water. It's the second part that's about the track. And starting back in Rio, that first week be became like a pool party for Canada, particularly for the women. And already here, it's feeling like it's starting again. Crowds thin by decree, loud by design. And Canada looking for a familiar feeling. The first medal of the Rio Olympics, a bronze, came from the women in the water, the 4 by 100 meter freestyle relay. So why not do it again? With no competitions during the pandemic, there was no way to size up rivals. Canada swimmers saw an advantage, more time to focus. They were so right. The question is, where is Canada going to finish? They're next to the American Rebecca Smith, Maggie McNeil, Kyla Sanchez, waiting for their anchor, Penny Alexi. That is how you deliver, and an upgrade from Rio's bronze to silver. Canada! And here's how you start a trend. Remember, when you see athletes put medals on each other in Tokyo, that Canada started it. Alexiak clearly Canada's lucky pen. She's now tied for the most decorated summer Olympian in Canadian history and just getting started. Anyone worried the pylon of a nation's expectations would rattle her needn't be concerned. I just knew I wasn't going to touch third. That was the only thing. And when I just make a decision through a race, I have to execute it. So I wanted a silver medal for these girls and I wanted it so bad I wouldn't accept anything else. Desire seems a superpower, because at the other end of the Tokyo Aquatic Center, another silver forge, this one in diving. Oh, nice dive. Jennifer Abel in her fourth Olympics, Melissa Citrini Beaulieu in her first. Oh, and that should be good enough. Abel earned a bronze in 2012. Rio was hard, twice in fourth place. She wanted more. In Tokyo, she got it. Have you called home yet? Yes, I did. How'd that go? I cried. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, everybody is super happy, and I felt so much love from uh, the people uh, from home. So uh, we, we might be alone here, but in our heart, we are not alone. So maybe you've noticed something different about these Olympics. There are lots of people in data companies offering projections of medal counts, but you're not hearing that from on the podium or the Canadian Olympic Committee. That's because given all the weirdness of training in the pandemic, it was just so uncertain how the athletes of the world would fare. So they weren't ready to call it, but you have to believe with this start, they're starting to feel good about what's coming. So Adrian, that's in the pool. At poolside, we saw some great celebrations by the Canadians and others. And I understand they're making Olympic organizers a little bit nervous. 
Uh, totally. So, uh, you know, all the hugging, uh, the maskless, the smiling, that's in the, in the DNA of an athlete who is celebrating. It's all instinct. But when the IOC saw that, they got a little bit nervous. They've now issued a decree that athletes must keep their masks on. They can pull them down for 30 seconds on the podium to take pictures. They have to go back up. They don't want people to forget the era we are in. So now, you know, on top of breaking world records, they're going to have to remember COVID, COVID. 30 yeah. seconds for the mask off. Okay, Adrian, thank you. Yeah. So you heard Jennifer Abel say it in Adrian's piece that in their hearts, athletes know they're not alone. Their families and closest supporters are with them. As Lauren Pelly shows us, that's despite the pandemic, the vast distances, and the several time zones. Not a pandemic or a time difference has stopped many Canadians from gathering to watch their local Olympians. People met in a provincial park in Winnipeg to cheer on local triathlete Tyler Mislawchuk, who later finished in 15th place. Canada has long punched abo well above its weight in triathlon, and Manitoba has long punched above our weight in, in Canada triathlon. And family and friends gathered in this badminton club in Markham, Ontario, to support not one, but two Olympians, Joshua Hurlburt Yu and Brian Yang. He made it, you know, in, and finally, so he was so proud, so excited, that we are so proud of him. This year, being the parents of an Olympian means being far apart. When I'm alone to watch the uh, TV video, I feel kind of uh, nervous and then uh, sometimes I don't want to <laughs> watch it. <laughs> After swimming star Maggie McNeil helped snag Canada's first silver medal on Sunday, her family said watching that win from afar was a strange feeling. If we had been there, we would have been spending a lot of time uh, organizing and traveling back and forth, but here we just kind of stew and wait. <laughs> Tonight, another competition and another round of waiting for hundreds of McNeil's supporters, including her longtime coach. This is huge, not just from the standpoint of cheering on Maggie, but huge for everybody who's here, who's endured 16 months of, you know, being resilient. For many, just being together to watch a local Olympian felt like a win, particularly for McNeil's proud parents. I'm feeling absolutely ecstatic. It's just years of 5 a.m. Uh, swim practices in the morning, all of that comes to fruition. A priceless moment, even from thousands of kilometers away. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. And of course, as we've told you, that waiting rewarded with a gold medal this evening. So what's it like for the athletes competing without thousands of fans? Here's Thomas Dagla on the pursuit of Olympic glory without that deafening roar of approval. Rarely have the cheers of so few meant so much. Teammates and staff serving as fans. Nearly empty venues make for an unusual Olympic experience, even at high speeds on the water. It's almost a little bit eerie coming into the last 500 meters. My dad has a really booming voice, so, you know, I'm, I'm usually listening for that. With family and friends effectively banned, this could be the next best thing. Live video from back home broadcast on the big screen. But that only solves so much. We love the fans and we love the atmosphere, so it is, it is a challenge, it's very empty. Though in judo, listen closely to hear a potential plus side to that near silence. With no fans in the stadium, you can, you can hear your coach very well. So we actually took advantage of this and, and improved the communication with the coach and the athlete. With nearly no spectators in the stands, Olympic organizers have thought of some tricks to enhance the TV viewing experience, including adding colors to the seating here at the Olympic Stadium so that from a distance, it doesn't really look empty. For added sound, they dug into the archives, pulling recordings from Rio 2016 and even earlier, artificially adding ambience to Tokyo 2020, and cranking up the live microphones to hear the games like never before. If you want to get somebody on the edge of their seat, the visual is important, but if you want to have them jump, it's going to be the sound. Consider this a made-for-TV event. With so few people here in person, even the souvenir stand is coming down. 
empty stadiums are still playing host to history. The medals won within them, still priceless. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Tokyo. Despite the safety rules, COVID continues to be a problem with at least 148 reported cases directly tied to the Olympics. Two of the world's top golfers have now been forced to withdraw. Spain's John Rahm and Bryson DeChambeau of the United States were set to leave for Tokyo before testing positive this weekend. And the virus is not the only threat that organizers are facing. Tropical storm Napartak is approaching the east coast of Japan. Forecasters say it could land near Tokyo late Monday or early Tuesday as a full-blown typhoon. Olympic organizers have already rescheduled some of this week's rowing events as a precaution. Here at home, the Montreal Canadiens continue to face intense criticism over a first-round draft pick. The team selected an 18-year-old who's admitted taking and sharing a sexually explicit photo without the woman's consent. Matt Demore now with the backlash. And Montreal is going to the Stanley Cup final. It was only a few weeks ago, a fairy tale playoff run for the Montreal Canadiens that electrified the city and the country. But now the focus is on a controversial draft pick. The Montreal Canadiens are proud to select the Knights de London Defenseur Logan Mayu. It was a moment the 18-year-old hockey player said he didn't want. Last week, Mayu asked NHL teams not to select him in the draft. Following news, he'd recently been charged and fined in Sweden for taking and sharing a sexually explicit photo of a woman without her consent. I sent it to my teammates to impress them. I've apologized to her, but nonetheless, this will follow her for the rest of her life. Jennifer Drummond manages the Sexual Assault Resource Centre at Montreal's Concordia University. She says the Habs should have respected Mayu's request and worries what message the team has sent by picking him. It almost gives a sense of like, oh, it's no big deal, just come on down anyways, no problem. Um, so I, I, I don't think that's going to be helpful for people um, and especially upsetting, I think, for people who have, have been on the other side of, of this kind of issue. Habs general manager Mark Bergevin defended the pick, saying the team will give Mayu the support he needs. Uh, he's a young man uh, who made a serious mistake of judgment, and we really uh, have to work with him. And we are we did talk to him, and he's uh, he's fully aware of that, and we're very remorseful. Isabelle Charret, a former Olympian and Quebec's minister responsible for the status of women, tweeted her disappointment with the pick. She said having athletic abilities is one thing, but those who possess them should be role models on and off the ice. Matt Damour, CBC News, Montreal. Let's turn now to Canada's wildfire situation. More people were forced to evacuate this weekend as wildfires in Manitoba and British Columbia continue to threaten communities. Across Canada, these are just the fires deemed out of control. You can see they're burning all the way from Yukon and as far east as Quebec. And all that smoke is affecting air quality. Environment Canada issuing alerts today for six provinces. Improving conditions in northern B.C. have allowed some evacuation orders to be lifted. But in the south, more people are being ordered out as the threat intensifies. Tanya Fletcher takes us there. Holy crap. The overall number of fires in B.C. may have gone down, but the ones of greatest concern are only growing. We're driving right by it. This one in the southern interior has been burning for more than a week, and overnight, the flame suddenly jumped this highway. It's making the arrival of more help this weekend even more timely. A small Canadian contingent welcomed 101 firefighters stepping off a plane from Mexico. The crews here from Mexico are top rate, uh, incredibly uh, uh, skilled at the job they're going to do. The crew from Mexico is going straight to the South Okanagan where the fire threat is growing and firefighters have been using controlled burns to try to take away some of that unpredictability. The challenge is, uh, is the terrain. Um, uh, most of this is very rugged. Uh, so the, the best way of uh, dealing with this is to remove the fuel. There, the Incomeep Creek fire between Oliver and Soyuz is a top priority. Hundreds were ordered to leave, but not all have. It's very scary. It really is. 
Kaylee Howard lives on site at the NC Chen Creek campground, which was evacuated last week. She and a few others stayed behind to protect the property. This is all we've got. We don't have insurance for all the items that mean things to us. So basically we just get all of our items out and try and be here to make these fire guards. That campground is on a Soyuz Indian Band territory. As native people, I mean, the land is so important to us and we've all grown up in these mountains, in these forests, um, not just for hunting purposes, but recreational purposes, spiritual purposes, and to, and to see them burnt is, is really sad. And there's no relief in sight. Another round of unrelenting heat and no rain in the forecast. It's all hoping right now. Meaning more uncertainty for those living in limbo. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. In the western United States, danger is mounting as firefighters struggle to contain dozens of huge wildfires. California's largest blaze, the Dixie Fire, merged with a smaller one this weekend, consuming homes in an area that's tough for firefighters to get to. And Oregon's bootleg fire, it's the biggest in the U.S., and it is still burning out of control. So big, it's creating its own weather, including a recent tornado on its perimeter. The COVID situation in the U.S. continues to worsen tonight. The number of new infections is soaring, boosted by both that highly transmissible Delta variant and the number of unvaccinated people. Paul Hunter now with the push to try to change minds. Like a nightmare out of 2020, this is the scene now in still so many U.S. hospitals, crowded with new COVID patients at a time COVID vaccine in America is not only widely available, it's for free. We're going in the wrong direction. We have the tools to do this. This is an unnecessary predicament we're putting ourselves in. The fresh COVID spikes in this country are indeed all about the unvaccinated. More than a third of Americans, most of whom say they don't believe in it, despite all the evidence. These making their views clear this weekend in New York. Meanwhile, from those who have been vaxxed, growing worries the unvaxxed pose a threat to all. Yeah. And so increasingly in the U.S., including, for example, almost all the bars in San Francisco, signs like this with new rules for entry. In Maryland, there's talk of certain places soon requiring a kind of vaccination passport. We're looking at all strategies uh, to fight the pandemic, and especially with the uptick right now. Because in the face of everything, remarkably, denial continues. I'm a healthy person. I don't have any underlying health issues. So I'm not really concerned about it. Neither were Tate and Christine Ezzi. Both were vaccine deniers. He caught it. So did she. Christine eventually needed a ventilator. She was pregnant. We lost the baby at some point. We just know the baby was stillborn. So uh, that all we know is the oxygen just dropped too low at some point. That family's plan now is to get vaccinated. Say so many scientists, if the rest of America followed suit, the whole country could move past this quickly. But instead of vaccine jabs, COVID spikes continue. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. In this country, the pandemic has exposed and in many cases exacerbated the challenges that some long-term care homes face, including finding enough people to work. Now one home in rural Nova Scotia is trying something new. As Shana Luck explains, it's looking for talent among refugees. He's always smiling. He's always nice. Thank you. Kodor Lawi is thriving in his new role as a caregiver to residents of a Nova Scotia long-term care home. He's been on the job in New Glasgow since December, caring for six people, including Dorothy Royals. From the first thing in the morning, and from getting in breakfast trays to the last thing at night, he's on the ball. He emigrated to Nova Scotia just eight months ago from southern Lebanon. Despite 20 years of working in refugee camps as a trauma nurse and paramedic for organizations like Doctors Without Borders, as a Palestinian refugee, he had no official status in Lebanon. That excluded him and his two young daughters from many jobs and schools there. So when he found out he had a job offer from a Canadian long-term care home, he jumped at the chance. I was so, so, so happy. Uh, I can't imagine 
uh, and in that moment what's happened it's it is i'm uh, is it really I, i'm in dream the home is trying to deal with a staffing shortage through a recruitment campaign they've partnered with the united nations high commissioner for refugees so we're not attracting people from Pictou County, Nova Scotia, or even Canada. The role doesn't pay enough, there aren't enough of them, and the workload is too heavy. But the town can offer refugees a new home for their families, even housing support. They certainly are making the same wage as a CCA from Nova Scotia, but it is about rebuilding their lives. Ramlawi's wife left a career in human resources. She says the move was really for their daughters. We didn't like want them to be like restricted with any uh, um, rules based on their like na nationality. Other homes across the country are watching. When we are looking outside of Canada, we need to be able to have pathways and policies that support employers. Glenhaven Manor made 15 job offers to refugees so far. Kador Ramlawi is the first to arrive. Four more people have come to Canada since. Shana Luck, CBC News, New Glasgow, Nova Scotia. Tomorrow, Mary Simon will make history when she's installed as Canada's first Indigenous Governor General. But when she walks into the Senate, she'll find the room pretty empty. Usually the upper chamber is packed for such ceremonies, but because of public health rules, for Simon, there will only be 44 people in attendance. And everyone has to wear masks and remain physically distant. Officials have also asked Canadians to stay away from the National War Memorial, where Simon will lay a wreath. CBC News will have live coverage of the installation of the Governor General. The ceremony will be conducted for the first time in both English and Inuktitut. Chief political correspondent Rosemary Barton will be there starting at 10 a.m. Eastern on CBC News Network, CBC Television and CBC Gem. Ahead on the National, an Olympic gymnast lands her final vault at the age of 46. An emotional farewell after eight Olympic Games. Plus, as Canadians return to the office, more pets are ending up in shelters. People are trying to get back to the normal of life, and maybe in that, the animals are kind of slipping to the side a little bit. What experts say pet owners should do if they're feeling overwhelmed. When the pandemic shut down concerts, one band took the show on the road. Welcome back. Starting today, Quebecers who have had at least one COVID vaccine shot are eligible to enter that province's vaccine lottery. $2 million in cash and bursaries are up for grabs. Quebec is trying to get 75% of its eligible population fully vaccinated by the end of August. That number is currently just under 60%. Quebec is also now allowing people who got at least one dose of AstraZeneca or the Covishield vaccine to get a third shot of an mRNA vaccine. The goal to make it easier to travel to places where AstraZeneca isn't accepted. But as Joanna Emiliotis shows us, Others in this country are pushing for a third shot for a completely different reason. The isolation hasn't ended. It's life in lockdown with no end in sight. It's been, it's been tough. I mean, I, I'm really worried about the impact that it's having on, on my family. Um, you know, especially um, Bryson who... <laughs> Bryson is disabled. He and his entire family are fully vaccinated, but still confined to home all to keep Keith MacArthur safe. MacArthur is a kidney transplant recipient. He's had two doses, but recently found out he is still vulnerable. So I was kind of expecting that I, I might have lowered antibodies, but I think that was a real shock for all of us that there were none at all. As life moves towards normal, for many it is still at a standstill. It's estimated more than a million Canadians are immunocompromised. Vaccines don't work as well for them, or at all. It's why MacArthur made this public appeal for a third dose. There's no guarantee, so, but, but you know, just to know that there is a, a chance makes it worthwhile. France and Israel are already giving booster shots to immunocompromised people. The UK is planning to do the same and the US is now considering it too. In Canada, health authorities say they're still tracking the emerging data. And more is coming. A new Toronto study on the efficacy of three doses for transplant recipients will be published soon. 
It measured antibody levels and other arms of immunity, including T cell response, which protects against severe disease. So we can see how long immunity is lasting. Dr. Dipali Kumar is leading it. Her earlier work suggests two doses can trigger a wider immune response among some transplant recipients. Is that a, a glimmer of good news, then, Yeah, think? so I, I think that's, that's uh, very hopeful. I think that's, um, you know, I think it, it provides some reassurance to people that, um, you know, it's not that the majority of people are completely unprotected. Uh, they may actually be protected from severe disease. Three doses could offer even more hope. Could mean the MacArthur's can stop living life from a distance. I would love to, I don't know, like walk into a Tim Hortons or like, you know, like hug my family, like extended family. That would be good. Bryson could also get the hands-on therapies he needs. I'm seeing some of Bryson's skills and he's regressing. So we have to figure out how to actually make those things happen. MacArthur hopes Canada will approve a third shot soon. He's offered to move into the basement so that his family can move on. But they don't want to live separate lives even if it means still living apart from everyone else. Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Toronto. And as Canada's borders gradually reopen to tourists, some airports are taking steps to separate vaccinated and unvaccinated travellers. Toronto's Pearson and Vancouver International airports will now split travellers arriving from abroad into two lines. The airport says they're doing this in order to streamline the entry process since vaccinated passengers are exempt from quarantine rules. As pandemic restrictions lift across the country, people are again able to travel, get a haircut or just go to the movies. Nick Purden found out how some are responding to the return to some kind of normality. so excited bringing the kids with me we yeah. waited for about two years for this so we're gonna keep our masks on and enjoy Peter Rabbit today there's probably no better sign that things are improving than families going to the movies again it's been a hard year definitely been a hard year a lot of uh, mental health issues for sure poor kids uh, are going through it tough tough times with uh, this COVID. It's as if these days a movie isn't just a movie. It's a celebration that the pandemic might be coming to an end and that people made it through. It's good for the kids, right? We're so excited for them. It's the first to get out for a little bit, catch some fresh air, interact with people. Be excited. Marina and Nair are sisters. And more than a year ago, they made a date to watch a movie with their kids. Finally, their wait is over. Dude, the kids didn't even sleep, to be honest. See their faces, they're able to use priceless. The I'm excited. Of course, the reopening of the country means different things for different people. For some small business owners, this may be their last chance to stay afloat. The lowest point for me, I would have to say, came around the end of May, when my bank account was like in single digit, because I was just in my room. And I, I couldn't leave my room and um, I, cu I couldn't eat. I couldn't afford to eat. Andy Dinner owns this barbershop in Toronto. The pandemic shuttered his business for months. He had no idea if it would survive. How close did you come to closing down? I was like a, a week away from shutting down. I was about seven days away from shutting down in uh, late May. And then that's when we started up uh, a GoFundMe account to help us get some kind of relief and then like within four hours I surpassed my goal uh, it was pretty pretty unbelievable actually like the community saved me like it's just this is our barbershop now it's nice to be back I'd say so we got to go nice and short around the sides the today what Andy learned from the pandemic was that he isn't alone the other businesses in the neighborhood came through for him how does it feel to have the scissors in your hand again? I'm used to seeing 15 plus people smile a day because of my work after showing them. And then I went from that to nothing. So just being back here, just, just being within these walls, I, 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 I won't be taking anything for granted at all. I'm happy to be here. Ready? Woo. 
Ooh, baby. That's clean. All right. The pandemic has been hard on all Canadians, but the group that's had it the worst are our seniors. Frida Hopkinson Manning is 80 years old. Her best friend Irma died of COVID. To Irma with love, strong woman, friend of many, mother so proud and loving. I think she's in a good place. I think my life would be less lonely if she were still here. Anyway, that's life. What's the thing that you really it's going to be hard to forget this past year, but now that things are opening up, Frida says she's finally looking forward again. The thing I can't wait to do, believe it or not, is to go to choir practice and to go to church on Sundays. I love to sing. I may not be a good singer, but I love the music. And that's what I'm really hoping for. <laughs> when you're singing, what's that like? Oh, that's joy. <laughs> it's a lot of joy. You know, I feel so well when I'm singing. Frida tells me that there's one other thing she hopes she'll soon be able to do. So I survived COVID. I have my two vaccines under my belt. And I have a promise to keep to my mother that I will go back to Jamaica to take care of her parents, my grandparents, with whom I grew up. I love them dearly. And I need to go back to replace a tombstone on their graves. And that is the big thing that I think about all the time. The hope is that our regained freedom will allow us to pursue our dreams again, continue the lives we'd planned. How's it going, guys? Good, how are you doing? And maybe soon, going to the movies will just be going to the movies. Nick Purden, CBC News, Toronto. The return to a version of normal is also having an effect on pets. As their owners face the stress of going back to work and the resumption of life's other obligations, some of their loyal companions are facing the fallout. As Paige Parsons shows us, some animal shelters fear it's a growing trend. It's not a forever home, but it is a refuge for a growing number of pets with no one to care for them. Interest in adoption hasn't died out. Just have to message us on our Facebook page and then we'll set you up with an adoption meet. But the number of incoming animals just keeps climbing. I just think that people are trying to get back to the normal of life and maybe in that the animals are kind of slipping to the side a little bit. After a spike in adoptions across Canada during the pandemic, some animal rescues are fielding calls from pet owners who just can't cope as they prepare to go back to work. A lot of behavioural issues, uh, lots of separation anxiety, um, not being good with other animals, not being good with children, um, a lot of people moving that can't take their pets with them, unfortunately. Even bunnies need someone to look out for them. The demand to find homes for abandoned rabbits is overwhelming. This rescuer is asking people to be patient. Reach out to your vet and rescues and see what options there are, not just in terms of rehoming, but in how you can make their lives and your lives, you know, a little bit more enjoyable together. Gus isn't going anywhere. His owner oversees a national network of animal rescues. She hasn't seen many pandemic surrenders and says there are ways to keep your pets happy at home. What can you provide for? What kind of toys, what kind of enrichment can you provide so that they keep their minds active? The next thing to consider is, is they, the animal themselves might uh, experience separation anxiety. Overwhelmed pet owners can always reach out to their local animal rescue for help. They're used to giving support where it's needed. Just want a home. Paige Parsons, CBC News, Edmonton. Next on The National, a full day of events, including the debut game for one of Canada's flag bearers. Women's basketball gets underway, and Andrew will give us the update on what to expect. Plus, a gymnast's emotional farewell after eight Olympics on the vault. Stay with us.
All of this in Olympic first that has Japan buzzing. Two siblings, brother and sister, both winning gold on Sunday, both competing in judo. Japan's Uta Abe took the top prize in her category just hours before her brother did the same. The Olympic Games showcases athletes pushing the limits of the human body. As the slogan goes, higher, faster, stronger, but rarely older. In gymnastics, women are often considered close to retirement in their 20s. Adrian shows us one Olympian pushing far beyond that limit, and she's just had her Tokyo moment. Her name is Oksana Chusovetina. Great first ball. Absolutely brilliant. Her first appearance at the Olympics was in Barcelona in 1992. She's been at every one since. Tokyo, then, is her eighth, and it will be her last. And get ready for this ball. She is 46 years old in a sport where teenagers sometimes rule. Oh, interesting. She has a son older than most of her competitors. And on the circuit, she is an icon. This is the woman the star gymnasts from around the world want pictures with. <laughs> Somehow, she's hovered near the top eight for most of her career, has five complicated moves named after her. An amazing woman. The vault on Super Sunday, that was her last Olympic event. As always, she astonished all. One and a half twist. And at an Olympics, where the stands are hauntingly empty and quiet, even her competitors and their coaches burst into applause. She says, thank you very much. The respect in that farewell earned. What a sporting moment. And what a legacy. The next time someone suggests women cannot compete in the sport past their early 20s, the name Oksana Chusovatina will shut that down. Canadian boxer Mandy Bujo fought long and hard just to compete in Tokyo. This weekend, her Olympic journey ended. Last few seconds then. Bujo lost a unanimous decision to Serbia's Nina Radovanovic, an 11-time national champion. Bujo is the only Canadian woman to have fought in two Olympics. She finished fifth in Rio in 2016. Well, throughout these games, Andrew's part of CBC Sports Tokyo coverage. Here he is with a look at what we can watch for in the days ahead from Team Canada on the softball diamond, the basketball court, and the pool. So, two words for you, penny and summer. We've already seen them swim some outstanding races in Tokyo. There was Penny Alexiak's big anchor leg of the 4x100 meter freestyle relay to capture silver. And 14-year-old Summer McIntosh, youngest member of Team Canada, putting her best foot forward, best arm forward, uh, having a couple of strong swims, uh, showing no fear, really, against the USA's legendary Katie Ledecky. Just did not seem intimidated at all. Both Penny and Summer have their heats in the 200 meter freestyle overnight where, and you should watch for this, we'll see what kind of toll having so many races will have on them. The 200 meter isn't an endurance event, but their schedule almost makes it so. So while Canada sleeps, we will find out whether they will advance in that event. There's also Canada's softball team. They had a heartbreaking loss to Japan, and so the way the tournament structure works, there's no way for them to advance to the gold medal match. Based on the standings, we already know they can only compete for bronze. But here's the thing. They still have one more prelim game to play against Italy. So it's not for a medal, but watch how they perform after such a, a disappointing game and ahead of a really important one. And one last thing. I think uh, you should all be watching for basketball. There's no men's team in Tokyo, but Canada's women play uh, for their first game against Serbia. The team's got Miranda Ayim, of course, not just team captain for Canada, but also flag bearer at the opening ceremony. They've also got three WNBA players on the team, but Serbia is strong and Team Canada will be feeling the pressure. They did not go deep in the tournament in Rio 2016 or in London 2012 for that matter. And a repeat of that would be a big disappointment. There hasn't been a, a Canadian medal, medal in Olympic basketball in almost 100 years. So when you wake up, lots will have happened. And Andrew's co-hosting Tokyo Today alongside two-time Olympian and world champion hurdler Perdita Felicien. You can watch every day starting at noon Eastern on CBC Television and CBC Gem. For some, dating also feels like an Olympic sport, and for two Canadians, their search for love became an odd reality series. 
So ladies, who has been to Canada before? Never. Never. <laughs> well, now you're going. <laughs> a Finnish television show linking single women with farmers. Did the Canadians find love? We'll tell you next. Streets turned into rivers in southern Belgium yesterday following a two-hour thunderstorm. The damage is significant. Within just 20 minutes, the water tore away roads and swept up cars. Well, we'll change of pace now. We want to revisit a story tonight about two Canadian men who reconnected with their European roots, all thanks to a dating show. In the story that first aired in May, Bonnie Allen shows us how the two ended up on Finnish television looking for love and finding something else. When Matthew El Musa was first asked to be on a reality TV dating show, he thought it might be a scam. But indeed, the single 40-year-old farm boy with Finnish ancestry was just what producers were looking for. Hi. Hi. How are you? The Finnish Good, are show, you? roughly translated as Farmer Wants a Wife in the World, was shot before the pandemic and just aired in Finland. All these beautiful women of Finland and and now I'm, I'm looking forward to, to the chance to, to meet some of them. If I don't do it, I'm always going to be wondering what, it's, what would it be like, what would it have been like. It was El Musa's first trip to Finland and he struggled to communicate. He doesn't speak Finnish. Still, he says his late parents, both proud Finns, would have been delighted. I think my dad would really, I could, I could just see him smiling. This Halifax realtor who grew up speaking Finnish was also recruited for the show by a distant cousin. Calling him a farmer is a stretch, but... And, uh, we're in northern Ontario where I grew up. Roy Risnan had plans before the pandemic to open a rural bed and breakfast with a Finnish theme. I've also been, you know, single for some time now and, you know, I thought maybe, maybe it's time to meet a nice girl again. As cameras rolled in Finland, they whittled down their choices to three each. So ladies, who has been to Canada before? Never. Never. <laughs> well, now you're going. <laughs> a week-long trip to Canada. A little taste of uh, Saskatchewan's winter weather. It culminated in rejections and final selections. My big takeaway from this experience is I never want to do a, a dating show again. <laughs> I would never go back and say I wish I didn't do that, but I wish I would have put more thought into how emotionally difficult it would be. Both of their romances ultimately fizzled, but their popularity exploded. You know, am I going to be able to walk down the street if I ever go back? I am FIF, famous in Finland. <laughs> Both Canadians say they did fall in love, but with Finland and their heritage. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. Next on The National, the band bringing live music to the doorstep. Countless people were coming up to us and saying thank you for, you know, spreading so much joy. The reaction to their traveling stage is our moment. I really need you to A rock band from Kelowna, British Columbia named The Carbons is bringing back live music in their own way. Tonight we meet Carol, a decommissioned accessibility bus and now a personal concert on wheels. The musical group's inspiration behind the bus and their fans' reaction is our moment. We're the Carbons and we started out three years ago now. We dropped our first album called August Ash. touring pretty regularly up until the pandemic. We're really missing, uh, you know, face-to-face -face interaction with people. We started thinking about like, well, what if we had our own outdoor venue? And then we found uh, this beauty. So here's Carol right here. This is where we have all of our gear. So we have a couple guitars here. See the drum kit back there? So far we've done Vancouver. We've done lots in Kelowna, obviously. Uh, we just got back from Nelson at a campsite called Kokanee Creek. We just released a song called Summer Girl. And we've been playing that on um, all these these uh, pop-up gigs. We played to about 100 people. Countless people were coming up to us and saying thank you for, you know, spreading so much joy. And people are showing their thanks by throwing in a little money to uh, maintain Carol. 
which is the name of the bus, and uh, and even like make it a more kind of uh, sort of friendly place for uh, doing concerts because it is an accessibility bus. They've removed all but four of the seats. They also go up to houses, knock on the door, and say, "We'll play a couple of songs for you." So far, everybody except one has said yes. That is the national for this golden July 25th. Good night.